Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you all. Uh, please keep eating. It's wonderful that we're having a delicious early Thanksgiving here, which we shouldn't brag about since there are over 300 people registered on the webinar who aren't eating turkey and mashed potatoes with us. But anyway, welcome everybody on the phone. Uh, we're very happy to have you here today for the panel. I'm Cindy Lewin. I'm the chair of the nonprofit organizations practice group here at Venable, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, nonprofits uh, representation in the country. Um, we organize around representing nonprofits instead of around a substantive, you know, not just tax or employment. So we're full service, uh, and I'm delighted that you're all here today. Part of what we do as a nonprofit practice group is want to give back to the sector, and we do that partly by making these lunches uh, and webinars available. So we have a great panel today. And first of all, we have great slides with lots of color and all the creative charitable promotions that you and your colleagues have all been asking us about. So um, to my, uh, on the far right is Melissa Steinman, who is a wonderful advertising lawyer, but also does tons of work for both for-profits and nonprofits on a very unique niche of sweepstakes, raffles, contests, online gaming, video, social media. What else do you do, Melissa, in your spare time? A yeah. bit of everything. I, yes. I did not win the Powerball. Oops. I did not win the Powerball, unfortunately, so I'm still here. <laughs> um, but a general advertising and marketing practice, so, so along with influencers, social media, all those questions you've always been wanting to ask, I'm here for. Right. Right, and there is a social media webinar tomorrow that yes. ropes Melissa into speaking Yes, into. on ACC. But, uh, and directly next to me is Christina Vessels, who works with me in the nonprofit practice group uh, and, uh, and is a hu hugely specialist in all the charitable fundraising, cause-related marketing, CCVs, someone I work with all the time and is so incredibly knowledgeable. I'm thrilled to have her. And she has an article in the current issue of Taxation of Exempts journal with tons of footnotes on charitable fundraising. Uh, she is truly an expert. I'm delighted to have both of you. So we'll take, uh, we'll take questions as we go, time allowing, and I, I, I will be checking also. Not, I'm, not, I'm not just zoning out up here with my phone. I'm checking for questions from those over 300 people on the phone. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Oh, wait, I think there's a couple of, slide, a couple of announcements I should make. Uh, CAE credit, if you need it, I'm not going to read this slide, but Camille King over here. Right? is the person to talk to if you need this. And also our next lunch is uh, on December 4th. It has a long name, but it's all the cool things about state sales taxes, state property taxes, new exemptions, and of course the Supreme Court case uh, in Wayfair, which really changed a lot about sales taxes. So for those of you who sell anything or buy anything, which pretty much should cover you, uh, that should be a great opportunity. Okay, now I'm really turning it over to you guys. Um, so thanks, Cindy. Um, so as she said, today we're going to be talking about um, all things fundraising campaign structures. Um, quite a few of these are collaborative efforts between nonprofits and for-profit entities like uh, charitable sales promotions, free action campaigns, and uh, customer donation programs. Um, a couple of other campaign or fundraising uh, mechanisms that we're going to talk about. Um, really lies solely with the nonprofit organization. Those are um, activities that really only 501c3 and some 501c3 organizations at that can talk about, like raffles. Um, so hopefully we'll give you a good um, overview of these types of fundraising mechanisms and some general and practical advice on sort of what to know before you launch into them. Um, so about 39 states have charitable solicitation laws. Um, that number goes up slightly depending on what kind of activities your nonprofit organization carries on. But for the most part, for uh, to be registered nationwide to solicit contributions, you're looking at about registration in 39 states. Um, what is that trigger, though, that requires a nonprofit to require to be registered under those solicitation laws? Uh, it's the act of soliciting contributions. So um, a solicitation is any direct or indirect request for money or property uh, on the representation that that uh, contribution will then be used for um, charitable purposes. Um, so there may be uh, limited exemptions in certain cases uh, for smaller nonprofits and things like that. Um, but as we'll talk about in a moment, even when you are the beneficiary of uh, 
what are seen as sort of passive fundraising activities that could have uh, registration sort of um, consequences for your nonprofit organization. Here comes the mic. We have a question from the audience. This uh, fundraising activity, I, I presume, would obviously include um, a, ch a, a charitable a, a AARP or American Cancer Society, et cetera, of, of some kind of fundraising drive or university. Would it apply to a C3 who is applying for um, federally funded projects from the Department of Defense or? Sure. So we don't want to get too in the weeds on sort of what triggers solicitation generally, but um, it sort of depends on the state. Um, so a lot of states view soliciting grants as a solicitation activity uh, that would trigger registration. Um, it just so is there any distinction between a, government's, a government offering for a, a, to a university, if a university only did fundraising for research purposes, research grants, as opposed to alumni contributions, if, would that also, are they, um, is there any distinction there, or are they the, kind of the same thing? Yeah, and I'd be happy to talk about this a little bit more on the um, back end of the um, presentation, but, you know, when you're soliciting only from alumni, there could be exemptions from registration for those activities, um, it, it really requires sort of a state-by-state -state review um, of the solicitation laws. The states don't really, the states don't, the statutes are not, the statutes are not that specific that they exclude federally funded grants from if they cover grants. You have your own decision to make about whether you want, whether you think the risk that anybody will enforce it where you have such a sophisticated uh, person you know, on the other side that you're soliciting from, it's sort of a risk calculus, but the statutes are not so specific as to exclude those kinds of grants. Um, so, so what kind of pass, passive fundraising activities really are we talking about? Um, and that sort of brings us to our first uh, campaign structure, uh, which is charitable sales promotions and the commercial co-ventures who carry them out. Um, so what is a commercial co-venture? Um, they are a person um, who, um, for profit, is regularly engaged in some business other than soliciting charitable contributions um, and who makes the representation that the purchase of a good or the use of a service will benefit a charitable organization or a charitable purpose. Um, the classic iteration of that looks a little bit like what we have here on the slide. Um, Subaru has represented that now through January 2nd, for every car that you buy or lease at this particular dealership, uh, Subaru will donate $250 to Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools. Um, so clearly you have a for-profit entity. As far as I know, Subaru is not um, regularly involved in charitable fundraising, um, and they have advertised that the purchase of one of their cars will result in a benefit to charity. About 22 of the 39 states that we just mentioned that have these charitable solicitation laws regulate explicitly uh, charitable sales promotions or commercial co-ventures. Um, that's not to say that all uh, 22 of those states actually require the commercial co-venture to register for such a promotion, um, but rather, uh, you, you know, you just would need to know that there may be requirements in the background. Um, and actually, only six of these states uh, imposed an affirmative obligation on the for-profit entity uh, to register. Um, so for the other 17 states or so that fall out of that 39 bucket that we talked about a moment ago, um, it's not to say that they don't necessarily regulate this sort of activity at all. They just don't expressly use the terms charitable sales promotion or commercial co-venture in their laws. Um, in fact, uh, you know, they almost all indirectly re regulate this activity um, you know, here in the district, for example, to solicit um, includes sort of any representation that the proceeds of a sale will benefit a charitable organization. Now, to me, that looks exactly like a charitable sales promotion. So I think despite not using uh, those exact kind of terms of art, um, charitable sales promotions would in fact be uh, regulated by the district or states that have these charitable solicitation laws. Um, and what does this mean? I mean, you have to kind of consider... Um, whether there may be sort of initial registration requirements um, on the front end if you are going to be uh, the beneficiary of a charitable sales promotion um, down the line. Was there a question? Yeah. 
We can you to repeat the question. Yeah, so the question was of these 22 states, um, going back to the 39 states that generally regulate charitable solicitations broadly, and these 22 that regulate charitable sales promotions specifically, um, there is some overlap, and we're actually going to kind of talk about that in the slides that come up, um, but there would be potential registration um, obligations as a consequence of being the beneficiary of a charitable sales promotion. Um, actually, that kind of segues nicely into um, our next slide, which um, kind of gets into this. You know, you want to conduct a little bit of pre-promotion due diligence uh, before you really get too underway in your negotiations for um, a charitable sales promotion. So for larger nonprofit organizations, this sort of initial threshold of is the nonprofit registered nationwide to solicit contributions is a little bit more of a moot point. I think you know you can sort of safely assume that some larger organizations are probably going to be registered nationwide. But for the smaller nonprofit organizations, um, you need to consider whether, as I said, being the beneficiary of these promotions may actually subject you uh, to registration requirements where you may have otherwise been exempt. Maybe your organization um, you know, only had over a certain amount of revenue such that you met the exemption from registration. Um, plenty of states out there, um, Colorado comes to mind, that say you know, if you are the beneficiary of a charitable sales promotion, notwithstanding the fact that you otherwise would have been exempt, um, you would actually need to register. And we'll talk a little bit more about you know, how to kind of navigate those laws if you are working with a, non a smaller nonprofit organization um, so that you don't kind of trip the wire and sort of force registration where you know, it may not otherwise make sense for you to be registered. Um, once you clear sort of the charity's registration piece, though, you need to think about uh, the for-profit entity's potential registration requirements as a commercial co-venturer. Uh, as mentioned, there are six states that require this, and often um, those registrations need to be filed anywhere in the ballpark of 10 to 15 days prior to launching um, your campaign. Um, we've actually seen recently uh, an uptick in enforcement from Hawaii. Um, they will penalize organizations, um, or they threaten to penalize organizations that um, don't meet this 10-day pre-promotion filing requirement. So when you're in the negotiations for, you know, contracting and, and papering this type of campaign, you'll want to keep in mind that despite marketing departments wanting to, you know, hit the ground running and go, 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 we're launching Friday, you sometimes need to kind of pump the brakes a little bit and think about, you know, when those filings may be due. Um, that kind of ties in a little bit. We won't kind of get too in the weeds of the, the mechanics, but, you know, the contracts um, and other requirements may exist where, you know, the, the parties are required to have certain terms in, in the agreements, things like that. And we'll just talk about that a little bit later. Um, so don't despair, though, if you get to this point and you realize your nonprofit <laughs> is not registered nationwide or perhaps... Uh, the commercial co-ventures registration obligations are something that, um, you know, giving timing or other considerations, you're not quite in a position to handle. Um, there are actually ways to rein in your originally contemplated charitable sales promotion so that you can still go forward, but perhaps on a more limited basis. Um, specifically, uh, so if your nonprofit organization, let's say, is only registered in um, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, um, you might not want to engage in a nationwide charitable sales promotion without, you know, having to run an analysis of whether you'd have to register your nonprofit organization in, um, you know, California or the like to be the beneficiary. You can actually just by contract agree that the promotion will only apply in the states in which the charity is registered. Um, so we'll you know, what does that mean? By contract, you'll sort of specifically outline the geographic scope of the promotion. And subsequently, in your advertisements, you would make clear, you know, this promotion only applies in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, or whatever states you've sort of decided to um, run the promotion in. Um, sometimes, though, you need to adjust your plans a little bit more dramatically. So we've been talking so far about charitable sales promotion, which is, you know, the representation that the purchase of a good will benefit a charity. Um, but maybe that structure really isn't going to work for you um, or the commercial co-venture. Um, so what are sort of some alternatives? And, and we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Um, but you have free action campaigns, which basically reduce or remove the obligation to make a purchase. 
um, customer donation programs and, and just general uh, statements of corporate support will often fall outside of the regulated and registration requiring section of charitable sales promotions. Um, so free action campaigns. Um, here, as I mentioned, you change the trigger for the obligation for the company to donate to one that does not require any purchase or use uh, by the public. Um, so what does that look like? And uh, it may be a little bit hard for those of you in the back to actually read the caption here, and we're kind of going to talk about fine print and why that should be readily available to people. But um, here we have an advertisement by Crate and Barrel that indicates that for every post of a picture with your ring finger and use of the hashtag vow for girls, Crate and Barrel will donate a dollar to the charitable organization Vow up to $20,000. I think this was run in the month of October. Um, so here, we there's no purchase requirement. There's no um, trigger on, or there's no obligation for the public to buy anything in order to obligate the company to make a charitable donation. Um, so effectively, by, by removing that purchase requirement or the use requirement, you've now sort of removed the sort of key element of a charitable sales promotion, the inducement to buy or the inducement to use a product offered by the advertiser. Um, we'll talk about in a moment why you still probably should follow all of the general guidelines established for commercial co-ventures. Um, but the nice thing is that you wouldn't have uh, registration and bonding requirements for the CCV. Um, something to keep in mind here, too, is, um, Melissa, I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but there could be platform-specific rules to keep in mind. Um, so when you're with your marketing teams or your development teams and, and looking to set up this free action campaign because, you know, it'll be administratively easier to launch, keep in mind that, um, you know, Twitter, for example, um, either disfavors or prohibits uh, retweeting. So you want to be careful about what is the um, item that obligates the company to donate. We want to stick away from retweeting, but you can use things like, you know, use a hashtag or like our page, something like that. All right. Um, so fine print. Um, we just kind of talked about why uh, charitable sales promotions are different uh, than free action campaigns. Um, but one major similarity they have is their public facing similarity. It's, it's, their, chair, it's their disclosures. Um, you know, the CCV campaign that we mentioned for Subaru in the beginning represented that Subaru would donate 250 uh, to helping hearts for every Subaru purchased um, during the month of January or December. Uh, next up, you know, Crate and Barrel made clear, you know, Crate and Barrel will donate to Vow for Girls $1 for every uh, use of the hashtag up to $20,000. Um, both of these are great examples of what you're generally looking for in terms of disclosure. Um, they made clear the for-profit entity that will be making the contribution. They made clear who the eventual beneficiary will be, the um, dates of the campaign and the exact amount per action or per purchase. Um, I'm going to sort of put broadly this sort of fifth category of other, which would be any um, particular restrictions or limitations on the campaign, be it, you know, a guaranteed minimum corporate donation, a cap on the amount of donation that the company will issue, um, the use of the hashtag has to be used in order to obligate the donation, sort of all of your other material terms uh, that are important to know uh, from a public standpoint what is required to obligate the company to donate. Um, and you can see that in, in lots of different iterations. Um, earlier we talked about uh, limiting the geographic scope of the promotion, and that's particularly important for the CCV context um, your advertisements and your disclosures would be certainly one place where you want to make that abundantly clear if it's, um, particularly if it's promoted online, uh, you want to make clear if you're excluding the residents of certain states, um, and this would be the place to do that. Um, so most of the time, these points will sort of satisfy all of your state law requirements, but they have the added benefit of also satisfying sort of 
non-legal sources that um, govern these disclosures, whether that's the Better Business Bureau's Wise Giving Alliance standards for charity accountability, um, state AG recommended best practices. Uh, for those of you in the room, BBB accreditation is an important thing to keep, and standard 19 um, is one of the items that you certify that you will you know, maintain throughout the course of your accreditation. So um, it's not just the state law requirements, but um, you know, there could be outside sources too that, that come into play here. Um, so we've been talking and we will talk a lot about being creative um, and how we want you all to have wildly creative and successful campaigns, but uh, disclosures really are not where you wanna get cute. Um, if you are donating you know, 10 cents for every can of soup purchased, you don't want to tell the public that it's actually a dollar for every 10 cans purchased to make it sound like you're more generous. Obviously, the caveat there is if that would be one of those other disclosures um, where you actually have to buy 10 cans to actually obligate the donation. Um, but for the most part, you really want to make clear um, the per unit amount um, that's that's going to be donated. Um, and since this is sort of the... We've got a question? Yeah. Mike's, Mike's coming. Yes. Um, shoes, where buy one, I think it's buy one, we donate. Mm -hmm. Those all are subsumed, you know, consumed in your, that's a purchase and a donation, and you have to value the, the shoe? Or is yeah, there any so differences so, when it's a product? I so guess, the is question, question is about the buy one, get one, like, the Tom, like Tom's shoes, and how does that, how do these uh, you know, rules apply? Yeah, so the buy one, give one um, is definitely one of those kind of creative iterations on this. Um, effectively, the donation is made in kind rather than as a percentage of the purchase price uh, or as a set dollar amount per transaction. Um, but that would be uh, the type of structure that, yeah, you're, you're representing that the purchase of a pair of shoes will result in a purchase or a, a donation of a pair of shoes of presumably equal or um, greater value. I don't know the Tom's campaign specifically, but that's probably where it falls in line. Um, so it's covered. So it would be covered and it would be included in, in what we're talking about here. Um, and so because these uh, disclosures and, you know, the advertising materials that um, the CCV or the for-profit company is sort of issuing becomes the face of the campaign, um, really we find if you can get your disclosures right, uh, you're, you're well positioned to run a compliant campaign um, as you as you move along. Question over here. <clears throat> yeah, but, it, but a good question, which was, is there a requirement to disclose if, if there is a maximum donation in the campaign campaign? Is there a requirement to disclose to the public when that max has been met? So additional purchases aren't going to result in a new donation. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and um, there you, you should be doing that. That would be considered you know, part of your best practices. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about you know when you're determining what to establish as uh, your maximum cap. Um, you know, it's helpful to look at sort of historical practices or historical trends. You know, if you know that a particular campaign um, sold out in a week or sort of met the cap in a week last year. Um, you know, you don't want to run it for three months or something like that. And so, um, you know, that's sort of the 2.0 lesson, but it's definitely, you know, very helpful to think ahead and, and to keep um, keep track of the results of your promotion as you're, as you're going along, particularly for uh, longer-term campaigns. And it can be very difficult to do that if you're doing a short-term campaign, like you're doing a live telecast or, you know, like a PBS kind of thing where things are coming in all the time. It's hard to figure out how to track it, but it, it is what you should be doing. Exactly. Um, so uh, we've kind of touched on sort of the first two pieces here, the two bullets um, outlined here. You know, you just need to factor in that, you know, despite, you know, the urgency with which you might be presented one of these campaigns, you, you do need to kind of stop and think about, you know, when things may be due, how long practically it may take you to be bonded in a state, something like that, to comply with these requirements. Um, as for the written agreement, again, whether you're doing a free action campaign uh, or a CCV, best practice is to have the 
agreement in place and for CCVs in particular, you'll have to consider um, state-specific requirements like estimating the number of goods that you expect to be sold as part of the campaign, um, you know, making clear record-keeping requirements, things like that. Um, this third item, when and how the benefit will be transmitted, um, is interesting because uh, California, for example, uh, does require uh, CCVs to register in the state um, unless they can show that they've met certain criteria. And one of those criteria is transmitting the benefit to charity every 90 days from the start of the campaign. Um, the other two, um, you know, are really easily satisfied in your contract. So effectively, if you can guarantee that the 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 benefit to charity will be transmitted every 90 days from day one of the campaign, you can avoid registration uh, as a commercial co-venturer in California. Um, even if you were doing a free action campaign and wouldn't otherwise be subject to registration, this is sort of a helpful thing to know so that everybody is on clear ground and clear footing as to when benefits might be expected. Um, likewise, the how, um, Hawaii, interestingly, requires you to specify whether the benefit will be transmitted by check or by wire transfer. And again, this is just, it's really helpful to know, you know, so when you get to the end of the campaign, there's no ambiguity. You know exactly how funds are going to move, when they're due, um, things like that. Um, in terms of advertising, uh, this really should be in the domain of the for-profit organization. Um, the charity will want to retain control over the use of its name and marks in all advertising materials. And, you know, you'll set up <laughs> approval mechanisms in the contract, you know, by which you can kind of confirm how your, your name and your logo are going to be used in marketing materials. Um, but really, this should be the prerogative of the advertiser. Um, that is the for-profit company here. Uh, that may come as a surprise to a lot of for-profit entities who think that they're, you know, entering into this arrangement and they're giving your charitable organization this great benefit. And why shouldn't you go out and promote the very promotion that you will ultimately benefit from? And the reason to slow down and kind of think about that is uh, unrelated business income tax. Um, you could potentially generate uh, UBIT by virtue of promoting uh, the products that are at the basis of, of you know, this promotion that you're ultimately going to derive the benefit from. Um, obviously, UBIT is allowed, um, but it's just something to think about uh, when you're in the negotiation process with uh, the for-profit entities that you, you really want to have a clear understanding of the roles the parties are going to play, um, not just sort of the logistical considerations like payment and things like that. Christina, uh, yeah, I see so many questions. I'm getting so many questions online that we can't keep up with. To, I don't know how many we'll have time for, but I think in addition to you, but if you do too much promotion of these products, you can end up having a private benefit issue, which could actually go to the heart of your exemption rather than just to a tax issue. So I really do think you have to be careful about that. And this question that just came in, uh, I think sort of assumes a fact, not in evidence. What issues are triggered by CCVs that require the nonprofit to push traffic to the commercial company's website? And in order to get the nonprofit to benefit, so they have to go. The example is, they have to go to the to the for profit's website to get, uh, to, you know, to book the hotel and, and say which nonprofit they want the money to go to. And you know, so this is saying the question is, so what's the problem? You know, what are the issues of us sending traffic? And I think what you're saying is, you shouldn't be doing that. You have to be careful. Yeah, you have to be careful. I think um, you know. It's so fact specific, but you know, in terms of um, you know, thanking, think about the the qualified corporate sponsorship rules. You can direct uh, the public as a nonprofit. You can direct the public to your corporate sponsor's main page, for example. Um, but you might want to be careful about directing uh, the public to you know, here's the page where you buy all the things that this, you know, sponsor offers for sale. Um, so it can be very fact specific. Um, but in general, I guess what I was thinking of when, when talking about this advertisement piece is, you know, maybe your nonprofit shouldn't be buying space in a local mailer to, to actually say, you know, what the terms of the promotion are. Here's another question that's very specific. You were saying that you have to have the units. This is a question that came in over the web. You have to have the unit, you have to say the unit, you know, 10 cents per can of soup. And the question is, can you say use a percentage? Absolutely. Um, so these 
going back, the, the states that sort of expressly regulate charitable sales promotions um, do give you the option to list either the <coughs> dollar amount uh, per purchase or a percentage. Now, I'll kind of star that because you don't want to say sort of you want to be careful what you're pegging the dollar amount or the percentage amount to. Um, generally, the public knows what the retail price is because they're paying it, but they don't know what net proceeds are, for example. So saying that 5% of net proceeds is going to benefit your charitable organization would be a very risky maneuver because the public has no idea if that's, you know, if you had a $10 item, what's net proceeds? I mean, it, it is totally dependent on sort of the business's internal um, processes. And so um, as long as the public could reasonably calculate, you know, 5% of uh, my purchase price or, you know, $2 from every item purchase, that's a very clear representation. Um, and in those cases, using a percentage amount would be fine. Okay. I had a question about the uh, what, what, who is a commercial co-venture, and let me be more specific. So, um, for for a typical, stereotypical charitable organization, C three, if they were to partner up with a commercial company, that would obviously trigger um, the discussion that we're talking about here. If or many large companies have a, um, a, a philanthropic uh, um, subsidiary uh, that itself is perhaps a C three, and so if they're dealing with that. Um, philanthropic um, subsidiary of General Electric or whoever, do, do the, does the analysis still kick in or does the, the, the um, subsidiary handle the issues? So that's an interesting question because presumably the, the, the 501c3 foundation of the corporate entity wouldn't be selling products. Um, so if you're thinking of, for example, an Amazon and an Amazon foundation, um, you know, there, Amazon will represent, uh, you know, for certain purchases, 1% of the purchase price will go to the Amazon Foundation. That would be the commercial co-venture relationship with the charity. The Amazon Foundation then may elect to then sort of re-grant funds um, to a separate 501c3, depending on sort of what separate arrangements look like. No, then, then they wouldn't really be part of the actual advertisement because there, Amazon would be saying, we, Amazon, will give, uh, you know, a dollar or 10% to Amazon Foundation. And in that situation, you have going back to, um, whoops, going back to these points, you have the name of the company, i.e. the CCV, and you have the name of the charity that's benefiting. So in that particular transaction, notwithstanding what might happen after the fact, um, the Amazon and the Amazon Foundation would be the two parties to the charitable sales promotion agreement. Right. Yeah. So I don't know how we're doing on time. Should we cut back on questions? Um, <coughs> we maybe should... maybe make a little bit more progress and okay. happy to, you know, if we don't get to them today, um, I guess during the presentation, I'm happy to stick around afterwards and, and field some questions. Um, okay. So next up, um, this turns... Uh, customer donation programs basically turn charitable sales promotions and free action campaigns on their head. So whereas with a charitable sales promotion or free action campaign, you are representing that certain actions will obligate the for-profit entity to make a donation, here, in effect, you're asking the public to make the donation. Uh, some of the most common examples of this include um, just simple cash contributions. You might go to the grocery store and at checkout you are prompted, do you want to add a dollar to benefit your local children's hospital? Classic example of a customer donation program. Uh, another iteration of that um, is what's called a roundup program. Uh, so Lyft, the ride sharing app, um, started this a couple years ago and it's been wildly successful. Uh, but the premise looks like the image that we have here. You finish your transaction, uh, as long as it's not on a whole dollar amount, um, you are asked, do you want to round up the difference such that that fraction of a dollar is then transmitted to charity? So your ultimate um, payment amount is a nice even dollar amount, but whatever the difference is, is passed on to the charity. Um, 
A critical detail here, though, is that you want to make absolutely clear that you are avoiding uh, classification as a professional fundraiser. So those charitable solicitation laws that we were talking about in my view, regulate sort of three main buckets of activity. They regulate the charities themselves who are soliciting contributions from the public. They regulate commercial co-ventures or um, for-profit uh, enterprises that normally don't solicit funds, but which do want to, um, you know, conduct some program for the benefit of a charitable organization. And then they regulate professional fundraisers. And professional fundraisers really are individuals or organizations whose primary business is to solicit contributions on behalf of a charitable organization, and they're compensated for doing so. And so the trick is to avoid that compensation piece, uh, which is why it becomes very important that however you structure your customer donation program, whether it's um, you know, adding a dollar or some dollar amount to your transaction or the roundup, 100% of that amount uh, must go to the charitable organization in order to avoid the more onerous status of being classified as a professional fundraiser. Um, we sort of can't stress this enough. It's it's a highly, highly regulated area, and um, you just, if you are a company or if you're working with a company, um, you absolutely want to know about this so that you avoid it um, entirely. So what we just talked about are sort of your, your classic iterations of a customer donation program. Um, but we have lately seen um, an uptick in sort of creative twists on that. Um, for example, uh, the matching contribution. So we were talking about Tom's earlier, and that's slightly different because um, there, there's a purchase requirement. But here, for example, a matching contribution might say, you know, for every dollar that you donate at the register, uh, Safeway will match your contribution dollar for dollar. So you're still not involving any customer purchases or uses of particular services, um, but you know the, the corporate sponsor has decided to be very generous and they'll match that campaign. Um, another point, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, you know we've seen a lot of stores out there uh, that have loyalty rewards programs set up mechanisms by which uh, the public can then donate the value of their loyalty points that they've already accrued based on prior transactions. Um, so although that, um, you know, your 100 points to Macy's or what have you isn't really redeemable for cash to you as uh, a consumer, you can donate the value of those points to charitable organizations. Um, and the image that we have here, this is uh, an advertisement by J. Crew. Um, and it sort of represents that third point there where, you know, for every coat, every gently worn item of clothing uh, that you bring in to J. Crew, you know, this month, uh, J. Crew will, you know, transmit that donated item to charity and you'll get a coupon off of your next purchase. Um, so I don't know if you're paying attention, you might think purchase, hold on, is this a charitable sales promotion? And fortunately, you're still outside of those rules because the purchase is actually not required to obligate the donation to charity. The public is just making that contribution, and they, this is sort of a, a benefit to uh, the donor um, to help sort of motivate additional contributions. Um, yeah, I think one thing sort of to take away here, though, is that with all of these customer donation programs, uh, you do want to be mindful, um, you know, of the fact that these charitable solicitation laws do exist. Um, you are still soliciting for a charitable organization. And more importantly, for the corporate sponsor of these programs, you might need to be careful about whether the um, company might actually be viewed as holding um, property for charitable purposes or as a charitable trust organization. So um, we'll talk about ways to kind of minimize um, the company's exposure in that standpoint in a second, um, actually probably next. All right, so earlier we talked about the charitable sales promotions, free action campaigns, but those really raised, or different issues are raised by customer donation programs. So you still want to have in place a contract. You still want to have a license to use, you know, the name and marks of the parties, you know, depending on how advertisements are going to be issued. Um, but as just mentioned, you know, if, to the extent that you're holding charitable property, um, you want to have a clear system in place for how those funds or you know, the actual items, the actual donated property is going to be transmitted to charity. Um, setting that up, you know, 
to have a very low dollar amount or so that the company actually never really is responsible for the funds such that, you know, the, the nonprofit might go in and have its own bin and the nonprofit is responsible for the items collected in store, that can sort of minimize uh, the company's uh, risk that they'll be seen as sort of subject to registration for um, holding charitable funds. Um, additionally, the sort of the receding and donor data uh, issues all kind of tie into the same theme. The public in customer donation programs is being asked to make the contribution. Um, so as we know, uh, for contributions of more than 200 or $250 or more, um, you may need to issue a receipt uh, to your donors. Um, and so in a situation like, you know, with a Roundup program uh, where, you know, everything is sort of happening with the for-profit organization, you know, how do you, how do you know who your donors are? And that's, you know, one of the very important points that you should put into your contract. You'll want to make clear, you know, the very precise, um, personally identifiable data points that the charity would need to receive from the company, um, you know, name, maybe email address and the amount donated so that, uh, you know, proper receipts or proper acknowledgement um, can be passed along um, to the donor. Um, in terms of, um, you know, non-cash contributions, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the donation of loyalty points, for example. Um, often we see that uh, companies that sponsor those types of donation programs simply pass the buck and say to consult with your tax advisor uh, about, um, you know, the valuation of your donation. Um, and generally, I think that's actually good advice. Um, you know, the valuation of points and sort of how they're viewed as a rebate uh, to the customer rather than income can present uh, complicated tax issues for the donor. So, you know, that's a good one to pass the buck on. Um, but for monetary contributions that are matched uh, with, or for monetary contributions for which a donor receives a benefit in return, that kind of puts us back into your standard substantiation and uh, written acknowledgement rules. Um, you'd want to have the value of the return benefit um, outlined somewhere, whether that's, you know, expressing the value in the contract or, or other sort of agreement. Okay, pop quiz. Um, so here we have two campaigns. Um, we have Sock Drive for Thrive DC. Um, and here uh, it's Vita uh, Fitness represents that for each pair of socks that you bring in, uh, Vita will match your socks, your, your donation, um, with another pair of socks. Um, and then on the other side, we have an advertisement from World Market, which indicates that for every blanket you purchase, we give a blanket to a homeless shelter. So these two campaigns are really similar. Um, you b have two in-kind matching contributions, but what do we think? Any guesses? All right. So we have a customer donation program for Vita and a charitable sales promotion for World Market. And why is that? So the key is the words matter. Really, the only difference between these two campaigns is, um, you know, whether you're bringing socks or buying a blanket. It's that one verb that sort of changes this and puts us into a different bucket. Uh, Melissa and I were talking about this earlier, though, and there's some ambiguity on uh, the Vita campaign, um, whether you might have an implied purchase requirement. Um, so she really You've got a rack of socks <laughs> next to the sign. Uh, there's an implied purchase there. Yeah. So. <laughs> so you could get into some novel issues. But if you're looking at this in a vacuum and just for these two, um, you know, you, you have the customer donation program on the one hand and the charitable sales promotion on the other. Right. The state regulators are going to see what you have on the <laughs> Internet. They're not going to be in the store. Right. 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 So so <laughs> you really want to understand um, where is the donation originating or with whom, I should say. All right. So. To kind of round out where what we just covered and, and sort of key things to take away, um, you know, these are some general guidelines, right? We've sort of hammered home that you need to have a contract in place. You need to understand uh, where the charity might need to be registered before the campaign to solicit contributions begins. Um, you know, do you have to file notices? Um, I think a couple of points that we've talked on today, whether it's monitoring the results 
um, to understand clearly when your, your campaign has concluded. Um, you need to be flexible and you need to sort of monitor those things and, and really have a handle um, or at least a good relationship with your marketing teams and, you know, the sales teams at the companies to really understand uh, when matches have been met or things like that. Um, you know, one thing about in-kind donations that to me was not relevant until the first time I did this, but ask whether the nonprofit has space to receive the items donated. Um, we actually had a, we helped with a campaign um, earlier this year that was wildly successful and resulted in, um, you know, several hundred thousand uh, items basically being donated to the organization. As, as you might suspect, uh, space is limited and it can be really tricky to bring those in and then sort of distribute them for, you know, consistent with your charitable purposes. So, um, you know, it is helpful to kind of stop and think through not just the legal requirements, but sort of the practical ones as well. And then I think just to kind of close this out, um, the more you do these campaigns, uh, you know, your, your, your teams will become more familiar with the questions to ask up front. You'll understand, um, you know, what your marketing materials really should look like. Um, but, you know, to the extent that they're successful, you're going to want to do it again. And, and on that point, you know, we recommend kind of keeping notes, you know, working with your teams to understand, you know, what worked about this one, what didn't, um, what, you know, had we wished we knew uh, earlier on. Um, and, and you can sort of develop guides, whether you're the charity uh, or, you know, a store wanting to do these programs again. Um, you can certainly take the lessons you've learned to facilitate and, frankly, reduce your costs for the next time uh, that you want to do a campaign like this. So just a little food for thought. Um, do, you, do, you have a, do you guys have a couple, a uh, few minutes for questions before we switch to? <laughs> Excuse me. How much time do we have left? Uh, we have 45 minutes. Okay. Um, I think we do. Okay. Well, one question that came in a lot online is, what do you do when the for-profit company that you're working with, at, you're a charity, and the for-profit company refuses to file CCVs? And there are a number of related questions that are all about, what happens to you if you don't follow these rules? So, <laughs> um, so a lot of those will sort of depend on your tolerance for risk. And this is something we, we hammer home all the time. But um, let's say you're a nonprofit and you know, you know, you're registered nationwide. You know, you know, the nonprofit may have filing obligations in connection with the CCV campaign as well, which is something we didn't quite talk about. But to the extent you're working with a for-profit entity that does not want to register, does not want to be bonded, well, remember, those are only six states that require this. So kind of taking a step back and remembering that we talked about limiting the geographic scope of a campaign, um, this may be a good moment to say, well, we just won't run the promotion uh, in the six states that require uh, the commercial co-venture to be registered. Obviously, you can't just say that and then do something entirely different. So you'll want to have it in your contract, in your advertisements, and in practice set up so that you really are not effectively running the campaign in states in which there is no registration requirement, or in which there is a registration requirement, but it will not be met. Um, you know, in those other states that do touch on charitable sales promotions, um, and they aren't the ones that require registration, you really can get by with just having the proper contract in place, having proper disclosures in your contract, um, and, and making clear the responsibilities of the party. Okay, I'll hold the rest for later, in, if, if there is later, but now. I had you one, thank you very one much quick question, if you have a minute. So some of the states, like New York, take forever to approve a charitable registration for the nonprofit. What would your advice be for that charity who is ready to launch a nationwide charitable cause, you know, a charitable sales campaign? Would they delay the whole campaign, just delay in New York, or would they ask for, or would they just proceed and, you know, beg for forgiveness versus asking for permission? <laughs> it's a good question. I think, you know, it may depend on how many states do you have to register in. So if it really were only one state in New York, um, you know, you might place a call on an anonymous basis to the state and sort of get a feel for where they're going to come out. Um, I think that most of the time, if you can get your contract in place, if your disclosures are, you know, appropriately, you know, disclaiming what is, is sort of occurring as part of the transaction, 
and if the charity really has in good faith already submitted those registrations, um, not, you know, prospectively, we will plan to do this at some point in the near future. I'm talking like if you've submitted the filings and we all know that it can take months for those licenses to clear, I think there's an argument, you know, that in good faith you are complying with the requirements of the statute. Obviously, again, it's sort of going to depend on your risk tolerance. Um, technically, you would be, you know, soliciting uh, without having been licensed. Um, but if, you know, the public facing and sort of internal documents are all buttoned up, I would say probably the risk is low. But again, it would just sort of depend on a case by case basis how many states are outstanding and, and sort of where you are in the process. Um, but uh, sorry, to your final point, you know, you could consider launching in phases if that were, you know, something that interests you to, to really make sure that you're covered and you're not, you know, improperly soliciting where you're not otherwise registered. Yes. Yeah, so the question was if you limit um, the geographic scope uh, to exclude certain states, would that also preclude online solicitations? And different people may tell you different things, but my view is that it would not, provided that your advertisements make clear this promotion is not valid in X, Y, or Z states. And you're technically set up. So it's, through geofencing, through your software, that sort of thing. This comes up in a lot, a lot in raffles and sweepstakes and the like as well. You have to be ac actually able to screen um, for residents of the states you're excluding. And maybe that segues nicely into raffles and sweepstakes and, and other promotions of, of that ilk, auctions and the like, um, which we will talk about now if I learn how to use the clicker. There we go. Um, I, I work a lot in the area of raffles and sweepstakes. They're hugely popular. We've probably seen an uptick in requests to review raffles lately. Um, everybody wants to win something. Um, so we'll, we, we'll spend some time now talking about um, the very complicated um, laws that that regulate these types of promotions, um, and uh, which which unfortunately, if you violate them, have have criminal and civil implications. So it's really important to get these right. Um, all of the, all of these types of giveaways um, are governed first and foremost by the the lottery laws, which are the laws that have um, criminal uh, criminal. Uh, violations as, uh, as, as their penalties. Um, so uh, the fe there's federal law and, and every state has a lottery law, which is part of the gambling laws. Um, there are three elements um, to uh, uh, the lottery law. There's the awarding of prize um, by chance where the participants have to submit consideration um, to enter. Um, usually the prize is pretty easy to ascertain. Um, uh, and chance, you know, random drawing, uh, is, is typical, but sometimes when you pick every hundredth person or something like that, that can also be something that involves chance. Um, what, what is typically the hardest, um, to determine is whether there's consideration. Um, the purchase element um, is really easy to, to find or payment, and that's what we typically have with, with lotteries. Um, but uh, the non-sort of purchase, whether you're requiring something that involves significant effort um, or giving up something of value, um, uh, we all, uh, some of us went to law school and we remember what, even a peppercorn can be consideration um, from, from the famous case, but... Um, uh, something of non-monetary value can even be consideration. So that becomes very um, important as we analyze whether a promotion can be a raffle um, or an illegal lottery um, or a sweepstakes. And we'll talk about why raffles are different from sweepstakes um, in just a minute. 
Um, so if one of the uh, um, elements, uh, if and usually the consideration element is missing, you may have um, a legal sweepstakes or a contest, and we'll talk about those. But then even if all three elements are present, um, if you do things right, uh, it still may be a legal raffle or an auction. Um, so that's going to be the first topic we talk about. Um, raffles are generally illegal gambling. Um, but the nice thing is that um, mo most states have a raffle law that specifically, um, I think all of them, I'm warming up here, um, <laughs> uh, all the states have a, a raffle law that essentially says that there are certain exempt charitable organizations that may legally conduct raffles. The important thing to understand, though, is that the requirements um, for being a um, an exempt charitable organization that may legally um, conduct a raffle are really very strict. Um, so it's important to go over those requirements and make sure you fall within them before you go and conduct a raffle. Um, there are in-state residency requirements. Um, there are specific um, classification limits that you have to make sure you fall within the definition for what is a charitable organization in the specific state where you want to run a raffle. Um, and then there are often um, minimum periods that, that the organization either has to be in existence and or has to be resident in the states. Um, so I just went backwards again, still learning. When we talk about um, those, those, um, uh, the requirements for uh, administering a charitable raffle, we're talking about um, specific registration and or permitting um, requirements, um, disclosure requirements that must be um, on printed raffle tickets often. Um, there are certain reporting or accounting and um, record keeping requirements um, that can um, that can be required in in certain states and of course they can vary from state to state um, and then there can be restrictions in specific states on um, how big the prize can be um, where and how the money raised can be spent often um, it must be spent um, specifically for um, the, the purposes of the, the charitable organization um, and not even for the purposes of running um, uh, the, the, uh, the raffle. Um, so an example is that many, um, the 50-50 the raffle um, is very popular where you collect the monies, 50% is used for the prize, and 50% is then used for the um, organization. California has a law that says that you can only have a 90-10 raffle if you want to run that kind of raffle. 90% of the monies um, uh, must be used for the, the charitable organization, and only 10% can be given away. Um, so there can also be requirements on who can sell the tickets and um, uh, the types of payment that can be um, accepted. Um, D.C. actually has one of the strictest raffle laws in the, in the country. Um, they say that you can only accept payments in cash, not by credit card and not by check. That makes it very difficult to run a raffle, as you can imagine, in D.C., um, California and D.C. have restrictions on who can actually run the raffle. Um, you can't outsource. It has to be the organization itself that's running the raffle. So these kinds of requirements um, can be very um, difficult um, to comply with, particularly when you're trying to run um, a multi-state raffle. Um, and this gets into, again, some of those um, some of those requirements. One of the reasons why those requirements are very difficult is when we talk about the concept of running a nationwide online raffle. These requirements have made it functionally impossible to run an internet raffle um, that's nationwide. Um, it's not saying that they're not happening, 
um, because you get this, but everybody else is doing it. You know, I've seen this one and that one. Um, but the fact is to run a compliant raffle that is, you know, 50 state compliant with all of these laws, um, because of requirements like, um, uh, the, the DC, um, requirement or the like, um, it's, it's really not possible. Possibly the most difficult law to comply with is actually the U.S. mails, um, statute that says that you can't send raffle tickets through the mails. Um, there are ways, however, um, that you can conduct some raffle related activities online. California, for example, says that you can advertise raffles online. Um, uh, and most important, um, there, uh, there are, and I'm going to skip through because I've kind of gone through, um, the restrictions on size and scope. Um, California Act, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, um, the mail statute shows you why you can actually do certain things that, um, are talked about like raffles, but are really actually sweepstakes online. That mail statute has necessitated, um, uh, something that looks like a raffle, and there actually, there's an opinion from the Postal Service. Um, that explains that what you can do is have something that looks like a raffle. Um, but, uh, what you do is you use language that just says, um, uh, suggested donation, $50, for example. Um, but then explains that, um, you can also, uh, enter for free, which is something that's really more of a sweepstakes. Um, and that's the way that you can then run a nationwide online promotion and something that a lot of our nonprofit clients are, are using if they want to run something that um, uh, allows people to enter across the country. What's a sweepstakes instead of a raffle? Um, you can see from this handy dandy chart that unlike a raffle, which has all three elements, um, of prize, chance, and consideration. A sweepstakes gets rid of that consideration element. Um, and it, uh, it then, um, avoids the, the raffle. Sweepstakes have more permissive rules in many ways. Um, it doesn't restrict who can be a sponsor. You're not limited to qualified organizations. Um, that, uh, you know, maybe are resident in specific jurisdictions, um, for a limited period, a, a specified period of time, like three years, um, or, or five years, as you see under some of these raffle laws. Um, but what it does say is you cannot require that purchase. You can't require people to buy a raffle ticket or the like. Um, instead, um, you have to have either not require a purchase ticket or the like, or um, you have to um, offer some sort of free alternative method of entry. Um, this is why, you know, if you look at the back of the cereal box that's having a, a sweepstakes or the like, you see, or to enter for free, um, send in that three by five card with your name and address or the like. Um, and this is why, per the postal opinion I'm talking about, you see suggested donation, $50, to enter without donating, send in, uh, you know, a card, or just don't check this box and send in a check, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of the sweepstakes laws, um, most but not every state um, in addition to their lottery law, have specific sweepstakes and contest laws that, for instance, um, specify what should be in the rules. Um, uh, they don't all um, look exactly alike. The requirements in these rules um, uh, provisions aren't all exactly alike. But generally speaking, they require things like um, who's eligible, um, minimum age, where people, you know, what states, people in what states are eligible, um, start and end dates and sometimes times, um, the odds of winning, 
um, what the prizes are and what their approximate retail values are, things that we're familiar um, with uh, from looking at these rules. Um, we have a nationwide form. Um, it's, you know, you can come up with that. Some things aren't necessarily required by state law that we tend to include in rules. Things like publicity and liability disclaimers. Um, uh, so if something goes wrong, you know, the, the sponsor isn't liable. The sponsor can publish the names of the winners, um, a link to any, any privacy terms that have become so standard nowadays. Um, the right to modify the rules if something goes wrong. The, the, the important thing to understand is these rules are essentially a contract between, um, uh, the entrant and the sponsor. Um, so there are certain things you may want to include between just what's, what's specifically required in state law. Um, so the social media, uh, sites, if you're running something that's, that's on social media as well, which is super popular now, have their own rules. Um, so I, let's see, um, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, some states actually do have registration and bonding requirements as well, um, specifically for higher value prizes. Um, for sweepstakes where the total value of the prizes is over $5,000, um, you have to register and bond um, in New York and Florida. Um, it's a relatively simple process from a registration point of view, and there are companies that specifically devote themselves to providing these sweepstakes bonds. Um, so it's not as hard as it seems. Um, in addition, if you run a sweepstakes, say something that's um, uh, in conjunction with um, a retail um, brand and you run it through stores, um, then you have to register in, in Rhode Island as well. If you um, certain types of contests, um, which are more like essay contests, photo contests that are judged um, uh, or you're asking for user generated, some type of user generated content, as we call it, um, then, uh, you have to register certain types of those contests in Arizona. Um, some states require that you post the rules either in store, um, if you're running something at a conference, um, you need to make those rules available as well. So if you're sort of uh, having a trade conference or the like, um, or online, of course, we're all doing that nowadays. Melissa, can I ask you a question? Sure. Came in from the web. Um, talk, can you talk a little bit about games of chance and skill and how they fit into all of this? Sure. Like poker um, is the particular example. Poker is, is a special type of game of chance. And... Um, I'm just trying to see if we have a slide devoted, and I'll flip around or put it off. Um, games of, of skill are what I just mentioned, these judged contests. Um, when we talk about um, essay contests or skill contests, when you eliminate that element of chance, um, you can then um, uh, ask, in some cases, for consideration. Um, so again, that, that purchase... Um, or payment, um, in every state but four, um, you're allowed to ask for a purchaser payment. Uh, there are a number of things um, that are important to, to get right with um, uh, a game of, um, of skill. Specifically, you have to make sure that, in fact, you are asking um, for some type of skill, um, and uh, you're making it clear how you're going to select the winner based on that skill. Um, so uh, what are the criteria for selecting the winner? Um, uh, how, you know, is it creativity? Is it, you know, a great tasting recipe? Um, and then who is going to pick those winners? Is it going to be judged, preferably independently, um, uh, you know, is it, uh, uh, Chef Jose Andres? 
Um, uh, so you need to make that clear um, and then follow those rules. And, and also, uh, wh- how are you going to break ties? You know, if you say we're going to assign 25 points, five point, and the person who gets the most points will win, if you end up with a tie, you don't want to insert chance into the mix with your tiebreaker. Um, so those are some of the important things to consider. It's extremely popular now to run games of chance. I had mentioned user-generated content or UGC contests. Um, uh, so with that sort of thing, you need to also make sure that if you think you might want to reuse that UGC, um, that you are uh, making sure you pin down all the rights necessary to use that. Um, first in the rules that you're sort of giving a preview, but also that you get a signed release from your winners there. So in terms of the social media platforms, um, if you do want to re- run a social media contest or sweepstakes, and those are hugely popular now, so say you want to run something on Facebook, um, there are some rules to understand. Every ma- social media platform has its own set of rules um, and usage guidelines. Um, again, with UGC or the like, if you're asking people to post pictures um, um, or, again, those recipes, uh, you're looking for the best paella recipe, um, the IP rights grants um, that are written into the terms and conditions of the platforms don't necessarily give you um, the right to use for any kind of commercial purposes. Um, you want to reuse in, you know, the next uh, campaign to promote your your association or your nonprofit. Um, uh, you need to again go and get that that grant through your rules. Um, or through the release you're asking your winners to sign. Um, The platforms are happily now um, uh, experimenting with sort of e-commerce like Donate Now, so it's worth checking out what your platform is doing. Um, But it's important to understand that, say, each platform generally asks for a release um, for the platform in your rules. Facebook, to give an example, Facebook is probably the most complex platform when it comes to running sweepstakes and contests. Um, They do ask for that release uh, um, from liability and a clear statement that Facebook is not a co-sponsor, which you can understand. Um, Facebook also has rules that say that you cannot run certain kinds of promotions. Specifically, um, uh, you can't um, like gate um, or ask for like getting promotions. So you can't ask um, entrants to like your page on Facebook in order to enter. You can ask people to like a specific photo or comment um, or ask people to vote with like. So there's lots of things you can do. You can ask people to share a photo onto their personal page. Nothing that um, involves um, incentivizing sharing in order to win. Um, but it's important to go and make sure you understand those rules. Um, as Christina mentioned, Twitter is very sensitive to anything that sort of clutters their platform with retweets to win or that sort of thing, anything that's sort of spammy. Um, and again, that idea of, um, of, um, uh, releasing Twitter from liability, um, uh, so, uh, Instagram is very similar to Facebook, um, but you can ask people to follow your feed in order to enter. Um, it's just important again, in all these cases, in any promotion, really, that you have some sort of abbreviated rules, um, on, uh, that are on sort of your promotion that explain the very basic terms, um, and then generally link to um, the full promotion rules. A lot of the time, what you have to include in the f- abbreviated rules, um, again, you're probably very familiar from your day-to-day as, um, with seeing them, um, you know, the very short version that's on you know, an ad or the like. It's often um, dictated by how much sort of real estate you have on a specific platform, but you do need something more than just rules, even if it's only no purchase or donation necessary um, where that's the case. Um, In terms of, uh, we're seeing a lot of new sweepstakes platforms now, like Omaze or Prizio. 
Um, these are uh, generally, um, uh, many of these platforms uh, do take compliance into account um, and they're very, uh, they're very interesting. Um, it is important though that um, you do your due diligence in looking at um, the platforms are they, do they appear to be following the sweepstakes and contest laws? And uh, it's also important to note that most of these are sweepstakes and not raffle platforms, even though they are following a donate to win type of um, structure. If you look at closely in their terms and conditions, there is almost always um, a, uh, um, an alternative method of entry. Um, and if there's not, you should be concerned because they are generally national um, platforms and national entry platforms, which, as we've talked about, um, uh, is is really not possible as a raffle platform. Um, the thing uh, to be aware of is that their form terms and rules are often inflexible in terms of customizing to your promotion, except for. Um, you can make disclosures about um, uh, the specifics of your promotion on your page. So you need to look to see what you can do to customize that page to reflect what you are actually doing, if it is any different from sort of the form promotion that they are offering. The other thing to do is you need to think about um, whether there are any professional uh, fundraiser implications, who are those um, solicitations being conducted for, um, uh, Christina is is stronger on the the implications there, but often these are set up with um, uh, sort of related funds, um, and uh, it's important to look at whether they are being compliant on that. In addition, to the extent that you are entering into agreements from the outset, um, you need to make sure that your agreement with the platform covers all the bases in terms of protecting you, um, that you get the necessary representations and warranties about compliance, um, uh, and uh, you, know, you are protected to the full extent possible if these platforms are not compliant. Um, auctions are another sort of novel or an increasingly popular um, format in terms of online auctions. We're all familiar with the traditional silent auction platform um, and how it operates, but these new auction platforms online, things like uh, Qtigo, eBay for Charity, um, Bidding for Good and the like, um, uh, are very interesting. Um, the same kinds of considerations as the sweepstakes platforms, you do want to do your due diligence as to whether the individual platform is compliant. Um, uh, in particular, any um, option that asks um, the user or the consumer to pay in and then does not um, give back all of the money that they pay in if they do not win um, could present lottery issues. So if you see a platform like that, um, and the established platform prop, I say established, the probably the better known, like the ones that I, I'm mentioning here, um, platforms do not require that kind of pay in. Um, uh, if you see a platform like that, though, your, your um, antennae should be buzzing as to possible uh, lottery issues. In addition, um, there are state and local auction laws that can be triggered by auction platforms like this. Um, these platforms should be complying with them. But again, you need to be doing your due diligence. Um, and in the agreements that you enter into with these auctions, ideally you would be getting representations and warranties as to compliance um, because these auction laws um, are very tricky. Um, in terms of other issues with the auction, um, the, the charity can be working with the auction platform to um, raise money. The platform typically requires the nonprofits to be using um, the platform's terms and conditions without necessarily a lot of, of flexibility. Um, so the issue becomes how do you make sure that um, you can ensure compliance with federal and state disclosure requirements? Um, uh, you know, in terms of the prizes being given away, there can be specific disclosures that are required for things like travel or experiences. Um, 
uh, and we've had situations where um, uh, clients have maybe wanted to um, give away a branded item that carries their bri- um, brand, um, uh, and there can be a potential CCV there um, to the extent that you're asking, you know, a client to purchase a, a sort of branded um, item rather than just some generic experience or, or travel item. Um, to the extent that you're allowing specific audiences um, or the platform is allowing specific audiences um, to enter or win, then there may be special issues. We're thinking in particular of children. Um, uh, you know, then there are compliance issues, A, in terms of whether the, the, the under 18 is able to consent to the terms and conditions um, uh, at all, but also in terms of privacy compliance and the like. Um, uh, you know, we have the same issue in terms of uh, whether these these uh, bids and and the items that are won, um, whether that that uh, they're tax deductible that Christina mentioned before, often these platforms just say consult your um, tax advisor, um, and and that's really what you want to want to be doing if you're asked as well is just respond. These issues are very complex, and whether the platform has has even addressed it in any way in terms of valuation and the like. Um, uh, you know, is, is, is a good question, frankly. Um, and you want to be particularly aware nowadays of privacy and information sharing issues. Um, the agreement that you enter into with the platform should be very clear on this. Um, and in general, whenever we talk about any of the, the issues that I've been covering here, um, a lot of, uh, the sweepstakes, um, uh, privacy becomes very important in terms of, you know, sharing the names of the people who are donating. Um, any of these platforms should be very clearly, um, very clear about what happens with the names, um, and emails and other personal information that's collected. Um, this is an incredibly important issue. Um, the new California privacy statute is very strict and people are still trying to figure out, um, you know, what it's going to mean and how to comply. And you certainly, while, um, you know, the privacy laws d- don't necessarily, like the California statute, don't necessarily extend to nonprofits, um, the people who are entering here are very, very concerned about privacy and what happens to their personal information. So you want to be very clear on that in the agreements you're entering into with these platforms in particular. Um, uh, in terms of best practices and tips, um, it's very important whenever you sort of start with a concept that involves a sweepstakes or a raffle, um, you know, the, the first step is to clarify what type of promotion um, or giveaway you're even discussing. You know, if you've got a raffle, the first question is, can we continue with this as a raffle? Can we comply with the raffle laws and the jurisdictions we're talking about? Um, or is it better to just run this as a sweepstakes? Um, if you're talking about one of these platforms, um, what are they asking of you? Where is there some give in terms of the terms and conditions, in terms of the agreements? Um, you know, and what are we talking about uh, when when we're addressing issues like um, the representations and warranties they'll give or privacy or that sort of thing? Um, often when you're talking about sweepstakes or ra- the raffles, the tickets, that sort of thing, forms can be very valuable. Um, uh, you can start with the form. That'll cover a lot of the issues and then tweak as necessary. Um, as we said, it's important to understand the social media platform rules um, and what we're talking about. Um, sorry, that should be off. <laughs> um, and what we're talking about there. And then also confirm whether um, uh, there are any intellectual property issues that are being triggered. 
Um, I mentioned it, getting the rights to your um, uh, any of the entries that you would like to maybe reuse um, and clearing the, the right of publicity in terms of the need to use winners' names, um, but also to the extent you want to use a particular name for a promotion um, or the like, you may want to consider at least running a knockout search for that name. If it's something um, that you may be running for a very long time, if you're giving away a very large prize or the like, um, you may even want to consider registering the name of that promotion if it's going to be very high profile. Um, confirm any registrations or bonding you need to do. Um, and then if you're talking about something that's a joint promotion, um, you may also, uh, you know, need to look at your agreements, get indemnification if possible, um, and uh, confirm the roles of the parties and what everybody will be doing um, as well. So I think that's it especially since I just drove some people out of the room. <laughs> They're all rushing back for their 2 o'clock meetings, but we have time for a few more questions. question about private inurement. So all of the, both of the presentations today, particularly the second the one. up to your mouth. Sorry. Uh, uh, private in, a question about private inurement. Both of the uh, presentations today had to do with the fundraising activities of, of various kinds. The second one in particular had to, to do with uh, engagement of various outside for-profit, presumably for-profit partners, collaborators, consultants, et cetera. Where does the, um, what's the threshold about private inurement? Um, and I'm thinking in particular, I forget the name of the case, you're probably aware of it, the cancer, this particular cancer philanthropy that spent so much money on an outs, on a fundraiser. The United Cancer Cancer Exactly. Case. So uh, is that implicated in any of, the, you know, in anything yeah. here because you're commercial, uh, you know. Certainly uh, in working with auction vendors and these platforms, paying reasonable compensation will protect you from private inurement. And, you know, these, there are, there, there's no reason to think their market prices aren't reasonable because there are, there is competition in this market. So I don't think that's a problem. As far as the CCBs are going, uh, these companies are just selling their products at their regular prices and then making donations. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case, whereas the United Cancer Council case was about hiring a fundraiser and having them collect 90% of, you know, they kept 90% of everything they raised, which was not considered reasonable compensation by the IRS. Um, so I think here those issues are, are covered in that as long as you don't promote the, your CCB partner too much that you're not going to be in a private benefit or private endearment category. You guys agree? So I have a, oh, there's one. This is, um, it's related to my earlier question, which I guess I'll, I'll put it a little differently, but have you ever heard of a nonprofit um, falling into enforcement by a state for not registering through CCV, not for solicitation, but so I have not. Mm -hmm. um, my suspicion is that if a charity um, were not registered nationwide, for example, and uh, if that charity was to be the beneficiary of a, a nationwide charitable sales promotion, um, my suspicion is that the first um, type of notice you would receive from a state regulator that found out um, perhaps you weren't in compliance would be to issue a notice. But um, I don't think, I think you'd have a couple steps before getting into um, sort of more serious enforcement matters. But where the nonprofit is, is registered everywhere in the United States to solicit generally, and they're also engaged in a national uh, CCV arrangement, mm -hmm. but not taking steps to separately, separate from the for-profit, register their CCVs. Oh, okay. I'm sorry if I misunderstood that. So um, I think I have it right this time that you're saying if a nonprofit organization is registered nationwide to solicit contributions, but perhaps the nonprofit does not itself file the notice of the promotion in, I think there's five states that regulate that. All right, we're on the same page now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you're saying no, basically. Right, well, um, so it is something that I didn't quite mention before. Um, I was focused a lot on the obligations of the commercial co-venture to register, and we talked about those six states. Um, quickly, the charity itself um, would have filing obligations in connection with the charitable sales promotion in five states. Um, those are fairly straightforward. They usually involve simply filing a copy of the contract uh, in the state, and maybe there's a form that accompanies that. Um, if a nonprofit were to not uh, submit those registrations in time, 
Um, I think, you know, my first suggestion would be to, to the extent you can go back and, and submit those filings uh, late, you know, late compliance is probably better than no compliance at all. Um, but it, it's sort of the same advice as I mentioned earlier, um, or not advice, but, um, you know, I think that if an, a state regulator um, of one of those five states that requires charities to register charitable sales promotions were to catch wind of it, they probably would contact you first and, and you know, ask for copies of the contract or something like that. I'd, I have not seen a case where a state launched right into penalties as a result of uh, not meeting the uh, related filing requirements. Thank you. Okay. I think that's the last question we had time for. So I want to thank our speakers. I thought that was great, incredibly informative. My apologies to all the people who sent in questions we didn't get to, but thank you. Thank you.